I'm excited to have you. So this is a recorded session. Um, as you may be aware, but just a kind reminder. Um, so what we do with all our sessions. So yeah, we will allow people to get in, settle in, and we'll introduce our speaker for the day and we'll get started. Um, there's a chat that's going on at the moment. So please um, take a look at it and keep it as lively as uh, our session will be. So thank you very much. Um, we'll get started shortly. We are very um, excited to see people coming in from, from many different parts of the African continent as well as diaspora. So um, please let us know where you're calling in from. I myself, I am dialing in from the state of Utah, west in the United States. Um, so it's a little early in the morning for me, which is a good thing because um, whatever I really do the rest of my day, whether it's not as impressive or as productive as this session, I will feel good that I've done something already. Um, so I want to know where you're all dialing from. So please do let us know in the chat. Thank you. Um, I will get started in, in a minute. Looks like the number of people joining has, has slowed down. So I think that is good. I see we have Valerie from Kenya. Hi, Valerie. We've got Livana from Malawi. We've got Said from Ethiopia. We have Steve from Kenya. Olemo styling from Indiana here in the USA. We've got Jimberu from Ethiopia. This is exciting. We've known Pilo from Swaziland. So the representation is, is very um, it is very spread out. So this is good. All right. Um, while well, more people come in and we they settle down, um, I think yeah, the number of audience trickling in and has been the same for a while. So let's get started. Thank you again for joining us on this beautiful Saturday afternoon slash evening. Uh, my name is Takunda, and I am one of the uh, founding members of Future Africa, and I'm here today to be your moderator. Um, I have the honor of introducing our speaker for the day, Ms. Obolang Ororo, and she and I, we had a chance to connect um, this weekend. I, I've been, I'm excited about what's in store here. Um, I am ready to learn a lot and ready to, to really um, have a constructive conversation with her. Um, she is someone who has held many responsibilities in many different positions and in many different parts of the world. Um, so I, I am just, at all in what she has done and pretty much inspired and you know excited for us to, to hear from her. Let me just read um, the bio that uh, we have for her uh, so that we can get an appreciation of her background. However, I will say that uh, the most important part um, about her story is the one that she's going to share uh, with all of us today. All right, so she is a development practitioner. She started a career in government of Lesotho. Uh, um, mother country uh, in the Ministry of Agriculture, Cooperatives and Marketing. She's also worked at the Institute of Southern African Studies as a research fellow, where she did research on agriculture and social issues. And uh, at the United Nations uh, Development Program, UNDP, the Office of the Residence Coordinator as the National Program Officer. Um, Ms. Barora has also worked four years as a researcher at the Namibian Economic Policy Research Unit, uh, NEPRU, where she undertook research on HIV and AIDS, socioeconomic and agricultural topics. She has worked for 15 years at the International Labor Organization, starting off as a distant 
work focal point officer and youth employment specialist in uh, the regional office for Africa. And she has worked her way up being the deputy director for the Dar es Salaam country office. Um, Hopo Lang has also published several working papers and selected articles and chapters in books that talk about HIV and AIDS, youth empowerment and agricultural marketing related topics. She's very passionate about women empowerment and youth and runs coaching programs and advocates against gender-based violence. Her other interests include traveling, running, reading, and writing. And she is an author um, of an inspirational book titled Joy Comes in the Morning. She holds a master's degree in agricultural economics from the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign in the United States. And she is currently the international level organization, ILO, director for uh, country office for Zimbabwe and Namibia. So welcome, Hope Lang. It's such a pleasure to have you today. Thank you for taking your time um, to speak with us young people and, and uh, have a very constructive conversation with us. That's ahead. Thank you so much, Takunda, and a very good afternoon to all of you. And thank you so much for taking your time out to come and listen to what I would have to share with you. And um, yeah, it's really a privilege. It gives me joy to come and join the Future Africa group and just you know be able to share some reflections. I don't have all the answers that I must say from the onset, but um, this is supposed to be a conversation. So I'm also interested in just having the conversation with you folks. So maybe just to start off, and um, yes, Takunda has said a lot about me, what I've accomplished, et cetera, et cetera. But um, yesterday when we had a conversation with him, I said, you know what? I don't just want to have a formal, or let me say, come out as a stiff necked UN bureaucrat. I just want you guys to you know, know that once upon a time, I was exactly like you guys. And you know, here I am today. So maybe just to start off by saying, why am I passionate about youth employment? And um, as I mentioned, once upon a time, I was like a lot of you probably wanting to study. I see some of you, you know, are continuing with your studies. Others of you are working. And so I also had those aspirations as well. And of course, aspiring for a better life. And, um, you know, then said, okay, what is it that I really, really want to do? And of course, in some instances, many things, but um, ultimately I realized for me, what was a starting point was that I needed to know myself. I wanted to know me. And I guess what was the reason why I wanted to know who I was, why I wanted to also appreciate me knowing that I have to live with me for the rest of my life was really then the background where I was, um, a child um, victim of childhood sexual abuse. And Joy Comes in the Morning, I think really basically tells my journey as to how I overcame. And um, yeah, in that process, learned a lot about myself and became self-aware of who I was and really started asking big questions as to what did I want to accomplish? And I didn't just want to pass through this earth as you know a person who was here once upon a time and that was the end of that. So that's where I really started now asking many, many questions. And I knew that, you know, since I had been through this experience, how could I also then help others who were probably, or who have gone through similar experiences, but who just don't know who to talk to. So hence then this is where the book ultimately came up and uh, not apologetic to mention as well that, you know, I'm, I, I'm, you know, I'm a woman of faith. I believe that where I am, is by God's grace. And so this is where I stand in terms of all that I do is knowing that this is where I come from. So I then, uh, you know, started then saying, okay, how could I make a difference? So I remember I was at um, the ILO and this was in 20, 2005. And I was then taking up the portfolio of youth employment. And when I took it up, then there was going to be a big, big conference on youth employment. And I met one young lady there and before I knew it, then I had started up, you know, a platform where young women could talk. 
about you know, issues, et cetera. And this is what then I continue to do in all the countries where I've worked. And ultimately then registered a charity called Daughters Destined for Purpose. And really two main objectives of it was really to mentor, coach young women. Ultimately, we are also talking about young men as well because we also feel that they also need the coaching. And then the second part of it was just raising awareness around gender-based violence and targeting specifically teenagers through a poetry competition, which we've been having for the past six years. We are going to the seventh year now. So that's what I do part-time when I'm uh, you know, over the weekends, et cetera. And then full-time job is as ILO director, but the two come together at some place because in this office, in the workspace, you will always find there are young people who need coaching. And so then that automatically comes out as a result of my passion for just seeing us young people or you, you know, young people generally moving ahead in life. So that is where my background, where I'm coming from and why so much interest in this topic. So when I received this invitation, Teranya wrote to me and asked, and I said, yeah, okay. Normally my Saturdays are for chilling and not doing too many things, but I said, no, you know what? Let me get involved in this conversation because I definitely believe in what they are doing and continue to engage with other youth groups also here in Zimbabwe where I'm based. And um, one of the things then also too, which I think has also had an impact on me is one time a young person came to me and asked and said, what one thing gives you sleepless nights? And I said to him, you know, what really, really bothers me is when I look around at the continent, the world, the young people, what does the future look like for young people? And then after that, he said, oh, so I said, yep, this is what, I mean, I don't have the answers, but when I look and I see, you know, what's happening in the continent, when I see, you know, the unemployment level uh, rates going up and I see, you know, mental health issues, I see migration, I see people, you know, really struggling to make a living, young people trying to enter into the job market, lots of young people graduating from universities with all kinds of degrees, but when they get to look for the jobs, no jobs. So a lot of them hustling with the qualifications, but no jobs. So that really, really, for me, is a matter of great concern. And I do not believe that, you know, there are very many they're not, they're not, they're not easy questions. There's no easy answer. There's no silver bullet to addressing this issue because if there was, we'd have long managed to overcome some of these problems, but we haven't. So I look at then the whole agenda then of youth employment being very interesting, that one, but not, but also recognizing the fact that empowerment is also important. And employment is part of empowerment. But where then I sometimes deviate a little bit is that I believe every young person is looking for a job, looking to get an income, looking for opportunities to generate an income because we need to live, we need to survive. So education, critical, very important. We, in order for one to enter into that job market, you have to be educated. But the question is, the education that one is getting, is it compatible to the job market? Because you have the skills mismatches which are happening in our economies where you find young people, I speak to them and say, okay, you've graduated, what are you looking for? Then they'll come to me and say, oh yes, we are looking for a job in ILO. So I said, okay, so what have you studied? Divinity. And I say, well, sorry, the divinity, divinity just doesn't, it's just not going to get you into the space where I'm in. So you sometimes almost see that there's almost the pressure and almost the desire to get a qualification. But the question is, is that qualification relevant for the job market? And therefore you also look on the other hand at technical vocational training and you say, okay, that makes sense, has always made sense. But then a lot of young people don't see that as a relevant qualification because what they want is they want a, a master, a, no, a bachelor's in something. And when you go to technical and vocational training, it's not always that you're going to get a bachelor's in plumbing, for example, it might be a diploma. And then we begin to put less emphasis on that one, which is critical. So now the issue then is back to my story of empowerment. 
and I'll just be jumping in between the two of them, is that definitely I believe that we need a healthy population. We need healthy young people. We need young people who know their, um, you know, the, the, what their human rights entail. We want young people who are also keyed in on, you know, the issues around political dialogue, governance, etc. Those are important topics and important issues for us to also embrace as young people. But at the end of the day, let's face it, what we are looking for are income opportunities. We want to earn some form of an income because we need to pay the bills, as Takunda told, told me yesterday. And so yes. that is critical. Yeah. So the point is then, how do we bring these various aspects together? And I mean, working for one of the specialized agencies of the UN, which is the ILO, you look then at other agencies such as the UNFPAs, which are looking at these issues, which are also very, very critical in terms then of how do we manage the dynamics. But at the end of the day, we need the money. And that's why then for me, I believe then sitting where I'm sitting is that employment is a priority. Employment is critical, critical, critical. But I'm not saying we throw away the other aspects of empowerment. That's also very, very critical. Education is critical. So I'm not saying that we get rid of them, but I'm just saying ultimately we need to know where are the jobs or how can we make sure that an economy is able to generate these jobs. So what also too, I would like to also just highlight a little bit, I think are some of the facts around employment because I think it's important at the onset too that I just give you um, uh, you know, a, an insight of what it looks like. And many of these highlights, which I'm going to give to you, I would like to tell you that they are coming out of a study uh, which the ILO has undertaken or some work which ILO has undertaken, which is the Global Employment Trends for Youth 2022, Investing in Transforming Futures for Young People. And the report was released on the 11th of August. So if you'd like to have a copy of it, you just have to go to the ILO website and you'll find it there. So what it is, is just that what, as I say, I highlight is global youth employment declined by 34 million between 2019 and 2020. However, this employment loss has translated mainly into the fact that a lot of young people or a lot of people left the labor market. And that of course was a result of what we were all affected by, which is, was the COVID pandemic. And so the COVID pandemic, what it did is it exacerbated the numerous labor market challenges, especially those which were faced by young people, because we know that in, all, in companies is that young people tend to have less experience. They might be the last ones to be recruited. And hence, when something like uh, COVID happens, they are the first ones out the door. And therefore then that means then it becomes extremely difficult to search and secure jobs. So this is what happened. I mean, it, was, it just didn't affect young people. It affected the entire world. Lots of companies closed down. A lot of jobs were lost. But at the end of the day, the young people always take the greatest uh, hit. And so it also resulted in a lot of young people who are neither now in employment or in education or in training. So there are some who have become discouraged, who have lost hope. And even when we look at some of the research that has been undertaken, you find that a lot of the young people, teenagers, for example, dropped out of schools, got pregnant, et cetera. So the question is, even with those ones who, are, who were teens, have dropped out, got pregnant, no longer in school, what does the future look like for them? For me, it looks pretty bleak because it means that, that they will now be relegated to jobs with where they are underpaid and where the skill set is really, really very low, unless there are deliberate efforts to bring them back into the education systems. So the unemployment rates varied or vary from region to region. And Africa has an unemployment rate, according to the, the trends or the document that I've mentioned, is that we are talking about 12.7%. But of course that masks many, many uh, youths who have withdrawn or who left the labor market. And therefore it's a, that's what the figures say. But I think if we went into each country, we'd find that there are a lot more underemployment young people who are 
who cannot afford not to do something. So they are counted as being employed and yet they are really, really underemployed and not really making much of an income. So we find that you know, over, one in the, over one in five young people in Africa were not in employment, education or training in 2020. And this trend has been deteriorating as a result of the shocks of the COVID-19. Then, of course, if I talked about other regions, you'd find that the Arab states have the highest unemployment rates among young, young people throughout the whole world. And many of them, of course, then are particularly young women. So that's in a nutshell of what it looks like, yeah, in terms of the employment rates. Yes. But then what also? To... Yes, Obolain. Um, yes. I, I, I wanted to, to go back to your point that you were yes. mentioning around the data that's reported around young people that are underemployed um, and young people that are not employed. Uh, Trisha in the, in, in the audience was asking how, how, how much should we believe around that? Is the data accurate? How much level of confidence should we have? Um, because it looks like on the ground, there are more young people that are you know, unemployed. And to your point, you mentioned underemployed and, and just seem to make the cut. So do, what's, your, what's your opinion? What's your perspective on, on the data and the actual reality on the ground? Okay, thanks for that question. And uh, yes, the, the point is that the data is accurate and why it's accurate, it's because of the measure or the methodology that is being utilized. And I'm not going to go into the technicalities of it because ILO also supports you know, governments, the national statistical boards in, or authorities in determining these figures. But what it is is just that if you are doing a survey or a census, what it is is that you're looking at a person who uh, who is probably looking, who is engaged in some productive economic activity within a certain time frame? So you might find someone who is probably selling tomatoes, and that person, according to the methodology, is employed. So it means that, yes, they are doing something, they are generating some income, but the point is that they might just be working for those period, that time slot in which the survey is being undertaken, but they are considered to be employed. So that's, I think, where the figures uh, come from. And of course, you know, as ILO, we've had so many questions and so much, uh, so much, uh, let me say, uh, doubt about these figures that, oh no, ILO, this methodology of yours does not make sense. It doesn't take the realities on the ground into consideration. And you find that sometimes that's what the whole session ends up becoming just about the figures. And I'm just saying to us that that's what the figures say. But at the end of the day, we appreciate that these people might be doing something. But there are a lot of people, especially when we look at the continent, you find that they're in the informal economy. And when mm -hmm. they're in the informal economy, you find that as a result, they are not fully productive. Uh, they are not uh, social security benefits to cover them. They are low skilled, et cetera. So there are many, many complications or complexities with it, but these figures are the ones that we work with as in terms of the methodology or accepted methodology in the countries. Yes. Yeah? Yes. Opaleng, there's also a question uh, from the audience. Yeah, I'm just going to be sharing. It's around um, a solution. So now that we know the high unemployment rate that is uh, on the continent, do we can we can we talk about how do we overcome it how do we overcome this high unemployment right. yes yeah we can I, I was getting there okay i was getting Great. there so this was just a pause but i was in terms of the questions that you were asking but uh, certainly yes we know the challenges and the challenges are humongous and how how is it that we can move forward to address them now i think there are many many there are many ways in which we can look at the issue of unemployment and let me also then just say it or start off by saying, and I'll start off by saying that, you know, there's no silver bullet and there are no easy answers. If they were, the unemployment rates would have, would have uh, decreased significantly, which they haven't. So one of the things which I think needs to be addressed is this skills mismatch. How do we have skills that are relevant for the job market? And when we look at that, then we are looking at sectors, for example, the green, 
the you know the green economy. We are looking at the blue economy. We are looking at the orange economy, which is the creatives and all. And you are looking at the digital platform. I mean the digital economy. So, what can we generate in terms of opportunities in those sectors? In terms of then the skilling, the reskilling to be able to look at these areas. We all appreciate the fact that you know climate change is with us. How do we create jobs in those sectors? So that's something that we could look at. Now, the other thing to which I think we could all of us agree is that most of our economies are not perform performing well. This was before COVID, this is during, and this is after COVID. Then you have other situations, Ukraine, Russia war, and you know, there are many other situations why we are not doing well, the corruptions, et cetera. We can, you know, there are many aspects. So first of all, or part of it is that our economies need to perform better. And the problem with our economies is that we have lots of structural problems. We need structural transformation. We need to move from lower to higher productivity sectors and economic activity. And for, because for most of our economies right now is we're very much commodity dependent and therefore our economic production does not take us or include enough higher value added sectors. So this is something that we need to look at as, as you know, our different countries. Then of course, another point to which I think is, which I've also observed is that many, many young people graduating from universities with all kinds of qualifications, all kinds of skills, but they're not able to be absorbed. The question is where are the jobs? Which sectors are the jobs? And those are the ones which I'm trying to say or which I've mentioned that we need to look at. But in order for us to find jobs in those sectors, first of all, we need to get our economy to perform well. We also then need to also be able to look at our policy frameworks as well, because some of our policy frameworks are not you know, compatible and not consistent with job creation opportunities for either women or either young people, et cetera. Then we also do need to have that, um, well, we have to look at also, you know, gender responsive, comprehensive national employment policies. And these policies must take into account, you know, pro-employment, macroeconomic, sectoral, and labor market policies at their core. And when I say this is that, you know, what we should be doing is every time there's a sector, mining, construction, tourism, creatives, is what are the job opportunities? How many jobs can we create in these sectors? Because if we don't look at these sectors with uh, employment lens, they are not, jobs are just not going to trickle down. And I think there's still a lot of that in our economies where we say, let's get the macroeconomic fundamentals correct and jobs will trickle down. And we know that does not happen. So we have to be very intentional and we have to you know, really be pro-employment and say, we want jobs, jobs, jobs. How can we create jobs? And government is not going to create the jobs either because that's also sometimes I think we are quick to point fingers and say the government must create jobs. The private sector can create some of the jobs, but what it is, it needs a concerted effort by all of us. You know, those in private sector, employers, workers, young people, we need to come together, bring our thoughts together and say, what is it that we can do? And of course, coming from ILO, I certainly believe that we need to have the extensive and meaningful social dialogue. I'm not talking of saying that, you know, we have these big, big conferences with young people and we say, guys, what do you think we should address in terms of employment? Because those have happened, many of them, but do they solve the quest? Do they solve the problem? No, not really. But how then can you as young people also be fully engaged and say, this is what we can do as young people. And this is how we'd like to see it moving together. And also too, one of the things to which I think in the area of partnerships and networks, I think as young people too, is that you know there are many, many uh, youth groups, many, many associations throughout the continent. How do you come together and speak with one voice? Because when we have these small little uh, groups talking, doing the same thing, commendable work, but then not coming together as one voice, it also in some way weakens and does not consolidate your views and allow the discussions to happen in a meaningful manner. So maybe these are just some of the thoughts that I'm having, but I definitely, from where I'm sitting, believe that no government is going to do it on its own. No private sector entity is going to do it on its own. 
and the young people on their own are not going to do it. It really needs a collective. It needs a collective effort on our behalf. And I think it means that, you know, we have to own this problem and say, this is a problem that we are all facing. And whether I like it or not, we need to get our hands, our fingers, our feet dirty in order to be able to address it in, a, you know, in a way that is going to take us somewhere. And as I say, though, I think some of these efforts have, we've, we've, been, efforts have been done, but it's just that it's a real big problem moving forward. Yes? Yes. Thank you, Opaleng. So one of the things um, that I, I'm a big believer in is you have, um, by virtue of the many hats that you wear, you have the, the opportunity to interact maybe with some of the young people um, that are being part of the solution, uh, you know, that are doing what you're recommending us to do, right? Collaborating with each other across countries and, and trying to skill themselves or reskill themselves, um, you know, in, in this very complicated and challenging job market, uh, per se. Uh, or let me just say employment uh, environment, because it's not only just about getting a job in the traditional sense, but employment could mean creating one. So do you have some examples of, um, you know, young people, groups or individuals that you have come across and you know of that you know, you could share with us so that we, you know, we can hold on to those uh, very tangible examples. Okay. So, yes. Yeah, so, I mean, I think the point is that, um, for example, I think what you guys are doing in terms of, you know, the fellowships that you are offering, I think is a, is a brilliant way to already start, you know, because I think you raise awareness and you are touching on a number of issues and we're having this discussion. So I think those type of entities are good. Uh, Zimbabwe here, for example, the ones which at least I've worked with closely are called the space. And for them, what they've tried to do is also facilitate dialogue and try to even bring, you know, government, uh, bring development partners, bring the UN and say, you know, we need to have this conversation. How can we make things better for the Zimbabwean young people? So, but I mean, that's one entity. And there are many others. I mean, you know, there, of course, you have, for example, you have the national youth councils in a lot of country, of course, which people would argue and say, you know, they are more dealing with government and so they might be biased even in terms of their membership, et cetera. But then the point though is then how do we crack this and say, guys, we have one common vision here. We are unemployed and this unemployment does not look good for us. Even where I'm sitting, I mean, in a couple of years, I won't be there in the job market anymore. So how do you guys now be able to take up these positions. So I do think what it is is also, I think there could be opportunities in terms of, and I also believe strongly that, you know, the softer skills also are important in terms of the mentoring, in terms of the coaching, in terms of also uh, shadowing some of these organizations where we can move forward and see how things work. But I think a lot of the challenges then for me, or which at least some of my observations is how do they crack into the space where these major discussions are taking place. And I mean, I was just thinking to myself and I was saying, you know, in terms of the region, we are divide, divided into regional economic communities and to what extent can entities such of yourself be engaged with SADC? And I mean, not only the SADCs, the AUs, they are also, I mean, I think you have to, we have to engage at many, many different levels, yeah? I don't think there's one specific door which is going to give us those opportunities, but at every single level, how do we engage as young people and keep on saying the same message over and over and over again without getting tired? Because sometimes in order for us to win any battle, you have to just keep on saying the same thing all the time and not get tired, yeah? Yeah, it sounds like we, we just have to have um, an activist approach where we, we advocate for what we need and we should not back down or, or not think or expect it to be handed over to us. We need to fight for it in every shape and form, um, yes. absolutely. Yes. All right. So Opaleng, um, I, I think you might be in favor for us maybe to see if there are any questions in the audience at the moment. Yes. Um, there's a lot of um, comments and questions that are being posted in the chat. So we can open up uh, a couple of questions from the audience and mm -hmm. uh, take those for the meantime. Yes, let's do that. Awesome. All right, uh, we can have some, I don't know if we can, if you can raise your hand. Uh, Tiranya, I'll ask for your help here to see if that is the, the approach we, we're taking. But if you do have, 
if you do have a question, uh, I will invite you please to raise your hand if you can, and then we will recognize you. Uh, Amanya, yes, please go, go on and repeat your question. Okay, I see uh, success. Uh, yeah, please read to ask your question. Can we have success and then say it? Yeah, yeah. Hello? Yeah. Yes, we can hear you. All right. Thank you for the opportunity given me to, to be part of this wonderful occasion. And my name is Sussex, and I'm from Liberia. I'm also a second mother of the, the Sussex Africa A Foundation. Uh, we are involved in helping, you know, bringing all the little children from the, the grassroots. So my question has to do with the unemployment with her listening to all the speaker and she spoke very attentively and she spoke very well and she was mostly based on the unemployment rate. So I want to know how uh, some mechanism we need to put in place to overcome the, the unemployment rate for, for now. Thank you. Thank you, success. Yes. Um, so, Opaleng, I I don't know if you caught up the question, but I'm more than happy to to try and 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 rephrase what I caught. Were you able to understand it? No, I didn't. In fact, it was breaking. So maybe you can. Yeah. Yes. Um, I think I, I caught enough. Uh, the question was around. You know, we we now know of this high unemployment rate, but what? What, what can we do as young people specifically to, to try and lower it? Um, so I, I think it, you've already touched upon it um, in a number of ways, but I don't know if you have anything to add specifically to that. Okay, no, I, I do think that, um, as I've said, is that I think, and I think you also had a good, I mean, I think you also rephrased in terms of activism. I think it's important that young people speak out and raise the voice. And I mean, I saw another question that, you know, collective efforts come with power from Tricia. Uh, do the youths have that power in Africa today? And I think the point is that, yes, collective efforts come with power. Do youths have that power in Africa today? You tell me, maybe not, maybe, but then how can you, then how do you see yourselves having that power? And I think that part of that issue then is for you guys to just dominate every single space you have. And just, but then the point is that I think where the issues begin is that you have to go in there with one voice because if there are five different voices, it's diluted, nobody's going to listen. But if you are going in there with the same story and imagine if you think about it, going from Cape to Cairo with the same voice, with the same energy that things must change. Things will change, I believe. But if it's just, you know, in North Africa, in uh, Algeria, Algeria, where we've seen it happen, and the, the unrest that came as a result of a young person speaking out and young people then supporting, something happened. So the point is really, I'm just saying that I think it's about coming together collectively, activism, but activism too, not now in order that we are coming there to also, um, what can I say, to also put down the government, point fingers, but being constructive. We want to take this continent further. And this is what we are putting on the table. But if you don't have anything to put on the table, things will be put on the table for you. Right. Yeah, right. thank you. Thank you. So we have two more hands I see here. I will recognize Said and then Olemo afterwards with your questions. Uh, okay. Uh, thank you uh, for just inviting me to attend on this really uh, exciting session. Uh, yeah, my, yeah, my question is uh, goes to our presenter. Uh, I think in Africa, uh, we do have a number of problems, yeah? 
uh, but you know, unemployment rate is uh, very uh, challenging in Africa, especially the uh, people are in uh, very challenging situation, especially they're under uh, employed and they are not employed too. So what will be you know, uh, the long-term and short-term solutions, especially to minimize these uh, unemployment situations in Africa? Thank you. Okay, Takunda, I guess I can just take up that one, right? Um, maybe let's get Olemo and Tricia okay. to also ask the questions and maybe you can just take all of them. All right, um, Takunda, can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you loud and clear. All right, thank you. Thank you very much, Takunda. Thank you, Opalang, for the very insightful and thought-provoking contribution to this very important conversation. I have two questions. One is in, in relation to our governance structures as they stand and whether um, government can play a greater role in solving the question of unemployment. Because if you think about the way we've chosen to arrange our societies, uh, our politics and the way government operates, you find out, for example, in Uganda, and I think that's the case in most African countries, that government is the biggest employer. And I think you hinted on this as um, in, in your submission as well. And the strategy for most African countries seems to seems to be that we need to leave the question of employment or unemployment to the market, right? Let's attract foreign direct investment. Let's encourage structural transformation, as you mentioned. So people move from agriculture and low productivity sectors to high productivity sectors, industry, value addition in agriculture, etc. cetera. Uh, a focus on skills and vocational training and TVET as it's known in other countries, you know? to encourage this culture of having more job creators among young people. But, and, and, and when, when you're speaking, it got me thinking again, right, about the fact that by 2050, the population of the continent is going to double, right? And that means that whatever problem we have right now is going to compound. So is there a way that the, st the state, the way we conceive the state right now and government in general can play a greater role in solving this question of unemployment? Because I remember you mentioning that you see the government will not create jobs. Uh, the private sector will not create all the jobs. So we need a closer collaboration. But what does a more pronounced role of the state look like in solving um, this challenge that we're trying to tackle? And then the second question is in relation to what we normally call our demographic dividend. That uh, we have a very young continent. We have people with a lot of potential. Uh, what is the approach? And, and this is drawing on your experience as well. How do we harness this demographic dividend? What does it take? Because I think in most conversations around the matter, you realize that it might be a ticking time bomb, right? As, as opposed to an opportunity for the continent. So what does it take for us to harness uh, the youthful energy and the youthfulness of the continent at present? Okay, so yeah, I'm going to read, retract all my words that we'll have a lot of questions for like for the interest that she actually remembers all of them let's let's stop here and then give you a chance to respond with these ones then i will invite the others um in the in the next uh, couple of minutes yeah okay so thank you so very much from the questions from the two speakers said and um i forget the name of the second Olemo. speaker Olemo. okay Olemo, yeah so thank you very much for these important uh, questions. And um, what I also, I think is important to put on the table is that as UN, as other development partners, working of course closely with government is many programs we have done. We have done programs like, um, for example, here in Zimbabwe, enterprise development programs with young people looking at the green economy and uh, looking at you know training, for example, in the or for economic opportunities in the rural areas. And I mean, I can go on and on and on. So throughout the continent, many, many programs addressing young people, as young people's needs. And uh, the point though, with a lot of these programs is that they are small scale. So they will 
probably contribute or probably show us that you know the that um, employment opportunities can be created so they can be pilots but then when it comes to then upscaling I think then that you know becomes a, sometimes we find that it's you know it's, it's a bit of a bottleneck as we try to move to upscale them so the point though is that how then where we have these good programs going on how do we upscale them to actually then be able to address the concerns of young people. So that's a big question, which we also, as you know, the UN together with our government partners, we ask ourselves, how can we upscale these programs? So I would like to also say that there's a lot which is being done, but the point is upscaling. And as Sage says is that, you know, we can do a lot of these programs in the short run, but at the end of the day, what we want is we want long-term sustainable programs. And again, too, as you can appreciate, is that as UN development partners, is that the funding to which you give has got a cap, it's got a limit. You, you, there's a place where now domestic financing has to play a role. And so that's also, I think, part of then the issue is when we are looking at our interventions, how then do we ensure that they are mainstreamed into the national development plans programs of the governments going forward. So this is why then I still emphasize that there needs to be that collaboration in terms of planning these documents, in terms of implementing these programs, in terms of also then bringing the relevant stakeholders and partners around the table to be able to address these issues. And this then also comes to the second question from Ulema, or well, the first question from Ulema is that, you know, the government structures, how can governments play a better role? I think when each partner knows what their specific responsibilities are, I think we can become more effective. Yeah, and government, as I say, they don't create jobs. Government, I think, creates the enabling, not I think it does create the enabling environment for jobs to be created. So even as I say then, when policies are being developed, to what extent are those policies being looked at in terms of pro-employment? Then you have to then bring the private sector who are the ones who have the resources to say, okay, you guys are the ones who are employing. Now, what it is in terms of the plan for this country going forward, we want to invest more in the orange economy. How can you guys play a role in then the job creation? So it really does need, I think, a concerted effort and intentional. I think it, everything that I'm saying here, I think it has to be intentional and I think sometimes Yes, partners have been involved, but not to the full extent that they should have been involved, yeah? And um, then also too, I think your other question was the demographic dividend. Yes, the demographic dividend is a reality and populations are going to double. And if we don't find solutions, these solutions will continue with us into the next few years. So the point is, I think what it is, is that in order for us to harness this potential is I think then saying that you guys are the ones who should be giving us some of the answers, yeah? And I think some of it is that, as I said, is that, and not only, I mean, there is a genuine interest for you young people to be involved in these discussions, but sometimes we also, as partners, are not intentional in bringing you on board. And sometimes we think that we might have the answers when we actually don't. So that whole thing around youth engagement, I think we need to do it better. But for me, is what I think is important is that in that engagement, we need to hear from you as to how you, so you guys are asking me questions, but I'm also asking you the questions, is how do you guys think you can make a difference in this youth employment equation? Yeah. Awesome, Opaleng. Um, Just to zero down on your point around policy-based solutions to try and address unemployment. Um, what are some examples if, if, you, if you're involved in any or you know you can point us towards looking at some examples of policy-based solutions to address unemployment? Uh, in your capacity as director of the ILO, um, what are some efforts perhaps that you're involved in in trying to uh, improve policies around how young people are employed, you know, in the various sectors from agriculture, logistics, manufacturing, uh, technology, arts and culture, you know, all of them. Like, are there any examples you can give us? Okay. So um, as ILO, I think one of the big one which we work on is the national employment policies. 
because we feel that you know if you have a national employment policy is that you are you are appreciating because okay let me put it this way let me put it in the sense that most of our countries you have a ministry of labor with either employment creation or with either uh, employment services or whatever the title might be so there's one ministry there and one sometimes the problem with that too is that all the other ministries say you know what we are not this employment thing that's, it's not for my ministry. Like Ministry of Tourism will say, no, employment, not my ministry. We have the Ministry of Employment. Already that's a problem because it means now that everything you do is that of everything you, once the word employment comes out, it's always thrown to the Ministry of Labor, Ministry of Employment. And that's not going to take us further. So even amongst the government structures, there needs to be that appreciation that employment is all of our business. Whether it's, whether it's you know, the Ministry of Mines, whether it's Ministry of Energy, whether it's the Ministry of Tourism, whether it's the Ministry of Lands, Agriculture, employment needs to be embedded in that. So in developing the employment policy then is to then try to bring together an intersectorial ministerial committee, for example, to say that you are all come and let's have a discussion. But before that then, I think you have to have the capacity building in order to raise the awareness, the appreciation for the issue because we assume that people might understand even within the government structures on this employment uh, creation agenda, but not many do. So we have to then bring them on board and say, you need to sit around the table. And that's, I think, what someone put it in the points here is that is a mindset thing as well, I think, is that if we are going to want to understand the employment equation, the employment issues, we need that sensitization. We need the awareness to be able to understand exactly what we're trying to do. So once you have the employment policy, and um, we have developed a number of employment policies in the past, but I think the issue now is to say, how do we also make sure it's gender responsive? How do we also make sure that, you know, we are looking at it through employment lenses? And once then you have that policy, which then covers the other sector ministries, then what they have that appreciation and begin to say, you know, what, this is important. So in other countries, Next level two is that where you see now the president or you know prime minister also recognizing that this employment issue is important and they are also championing it and making lots of noise about it, not just token, but actually putting resources to it. Then I believe we begin to see at least a bit of, you know, the diff we begin to see a bit of change happening moving forward. Yeah. Awesome. Thank you so much for sharing that. Um, it's exciting to hear like to your point, how you are involved as an ILO in, in like the national employment policy focus that you shared that I think we're, we're all very enlightened to hear that. All right, I will recognize a couple of hands in this order um, and and then Hopalang can, can respond. So we have Lemmy, Valerie, Daniel uh, in that order, please. And one more, sorry, and Tricia. Sorry, Tricia, I, you've been having your hand up for a while, so. Hopefully you can go this time. All right, thank you. Thank you very much. Um, for me, my question is, is on intersectionality because a lot of times when we talk about youth unemployment, we have a blanket image of what this youth is. This youth is able-bodied. This youth most, most probably has gotten an education and the national employment policies work for this youth. But my argument is we have, you know, a whole spectrum of what a youth is in our generation. We have youth with disabilities. We have the last mile youth who have barely gotten an education. And that is that looking at things from a spectrum of not and, and so in itself ourselves back in planning how do we bring every other youth to this table and like i asked earlier on even digital platforms the opportunities in the digital spaces most probably their last mile youths that won't be able to access them or even achieve anything beyond just empowerment at the grassroots how do we bring such a youth to the table because when we have these conversations, I always remember what, what a, this person wouldn't be able to get, and yet they would benefit to have their agency 
realize. So how do we intersection when we speak about issues of unemployment? When we advocate for employment, how do we intersection for the youth, for the last mile youth, for for youth with disabilities? For that's my question. So intersectionality and unemployment. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, let me, would you like to ask your question now? And then Opelin can respond to those two at once. Hello, Lemmy. Okay, it looks like there's some technical difficulties. Let me recognize uh, Valerie. Thank you, uh, Takunda. Um, good to see all of you. And thank you so much for the insightful discussion that our able speaker has spoken. So with regards to the aspect of solving employment, I would like to know what are some of the regional policies that are in place, either by ILO or other similar um, employment related bodies that seek to solve unemployment by opening up the labor market in Africa, because Africa is such um, an understated um, economy such that we have 52 states and there are various forms of economy from the creative economy of acting and music in Nigeria um, to tourism in East Africa and so much more. So what are the policies that are in place to ensure that you know, there's free movement of uh, labor and resources from one country to another? Because I personally feel like that would be such a great way to solve unemployment, as opposed to just thinking of, you know, majority of young people feel like when they get to go to the US or to European countries, there are better opportunities for them. But I feel like having regional and homegrown solutions to the challenges of unemployment can really make the labor um, economy to be more stronger. So what are some of the policies that are in place to ensure that is um you know sorted thank you thank you valerie yes opening maybe you can respond to those two and then we'll take more after that okay thank you so much takunda and thank you uh, trisha for your question and very good question in the sense that as you said is that many times we treat young people as a homogeneous group and yet it's very very heterogeneous so I think part of that is that in terms of programs that we do, I think uh, again, being very, very targeted because even the same thing I think is when we look many at least experience again now and bringing on personal experience to working in the area is that you find that we have a youth employment programs. And when we do the youth employment programs, the beneficiaries which are likely to come forward are all these guys. And you find then, young women are not are underrepresented in a lot of the programs. So the question now is that, and yet in the document or in the program document, when you're developing it, it was put nicely there that, oh, it's going to address you know, gender inequalities, et cetera. But when you get now to the actually beneficiaries implementation, you find that you know, the young women are underrepresented. And part of that then is also an appreciation of understanding why it was the case that you did not manage to attract the young women. And sometimes what our programs have shown is that the young women are sometimes involved in you know, the life cycle. Probably in the rural areas, you have a program and then you are going to uh, have training, for example, and it's not, she's not able to participate in the training because it's taking, time, it's taking place at a time where probably breastfeeding or looking after a baby, et cetera. So again, very, you need very, very targeted programs. You need to be inclusive in all the programs that you're doing is to say that you do need to target those who are living with disabilities, HIV AIDS, vulnerable young people, et cetera. So that's one way to address it. But on the other hand too, as you said now, in some of these conversations, how do you also involve this intersectionality of you know, young people? And again, I think it's being very deliberate that 
this program will not go forward until you are also having representatives from these other groups. So it's, it's, a, it's something which definitely is not, a, you can't take it for granted that it's just going to happen, but we have to be intentional in it. And in the same way, in terms of this dialogue, which I say we have to have, which is inclusive, we have to be able to reach out to the other underrepresented groups. And another point too, is that also, how do you use structures at the local level? You know, in terms of a lot of our countries are talking about devolution, but even if devolution is taking time to roll out, how do you ensure that in those discussions at that level, there are entities which are representing young people also involved in the decision-making? So mindset goes back to mindset, same old, same old, doesn't work. We have to do things in a different way and change, we know all of us, we don't like it. We'd rather work with what we are comfortable with, even sometimes, even with development partners, when you start to say, no, we need to look at it from this angle, it's like, no, we don't, we, you know, we are not, that's not what we are here for. And you have to then keep on reminding that, no, COVID changed lots of things. The situation in our countries are evolving all the time. We need other strategies. So that's how I would respond to your uh, question. And uh, then with uh, uh, Valerie, I think you asked about some of the regional policies. So I think in terms of regional policies, you must uh, also know that obviously you have you know, the AU as the continental, but then at every region, there are regional economic entities. So for example, where I'm sitting here in Zimbabwe, we work of course then with SADC. And in, with SADC then trying to say, what are the policies that at that regional level, which either talk to youth employment, for example, you talk about migration, is how do we then crack all this uh, migration, uh, excuse me, not migration, but how do we also allow for the free movement of people? So how then are we going to capitalize? How then are we going to take advantage of some of these policies? We have the African Continental Free Trade Agreement right now. To what extent are young people engaged in discussions around that as well? What does trade look like across the region? Young people, where do we factor? I don't know. But then I think these are where we need to find out how we can get ourselves on those seats as well. And also too, as I might also, before I finish here, is to say also too, you know, uh, as ILO, we work with employers' organizations, we work with um, uh, workers' organizations. Now, I mean, people can say that, okay, these are membership-based organizations, but we find that young people don't sit on these uh, platforms and they don't sit on these platforms maybe because you don't see the benefits, but again, it goes back to Takunda's point, activism. We sit there to make a difference and to say, this is how we would like things to happen. Because when we are not there in that space at all, we miss out, yeah? Thank you, Opaleng. Okay, I will also recognize two other hands that I noticed here. Um, we have Lemmy and Danielle. Okay, let me, I, I can see you're unmuted, but I don't think we can hear you. So please feel free to type your, your question in the chat, and then I will be happy to make sure Opalink sees it. Uh, Danielle. You're on mute. Second. Yeah. Hello. Hello, everyone. Thank you, Takunda, for uh, your moderation for this meeting. It's very interesting. I'm calling from Italy, but I'm truly interested in what uh, are you talking about. And uh, thank you, Opolang, for your um, discussion. And my question is around, um, well, uh, I'm a, a medical doctor and I'm, at the moment I'm a job seeker and uh, I have to face every day uh, the recruiting process. If you were a recruiter, Opolank, and uh, what about uh, the CV, the structure of the CV and uh, a cover letter? I mean, when you talk about a collaboration with uh, an NGO, in 2016, I work with Warchild UK, uh, that is a non-profit organization uh, that works also for Africa 
and African states. Um, uh, how important is working for Africa uh, in a CV? Do you think it's important? And uh, I've got a second question about the uh, uh, storytelling. Um, do you think uh, it's important um, the one page or the storyline strategy when you uh, are writing down a cover letter or a CV, also when you talk about the Africa itself. Thank you so much, Okolank. Kunda, would you like me to respond to that? Uh, let me give you Lemmy's question as well, and then you can maybe talk about two of them. Um, so let me is asking, are there stories, failure or success from generations before us we can learn from as far as tackling the unemployment challenge? Okay. Okay, thank you so much. And then Daniel, your question is um for okay, from where I sit, and I'm going to sit because I'm talking of where I'm sitting as ILO, right? And uh, when we have jobs which we post. Uh, basically what happens is that the, uh, well, any of our posts, because we have like international, we have national positions, right? So when the post is an international position, it's, a lot, it's centralized in the sense that the whole process, you know, starts through the central website, Geneva and all of that. But then it will ultimately come down to the country to then, you know, identify the candidates, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah. So what it is, is that for me is that if you are looking for a job in Africa and you have experience, you need to put it there, yeah? Because at the end of the day, we do need to know that you are aware of the continent, you've had, you know, you've addressed the issues and you've worked in the continent. Because if you haven't worked in the continent, then I mean, it's like, okay, but maybe not, yeah? So it is important to give your experience in terms of Africa and I mean, Obviously, like if the CV will say something like, you know, I went on mission to Tanzania, I was there for two days or for three days. I mean, that doesn't quite, that's not quite going to sell, right? So I think that's an important aspect. And then if it's the storytelling, which you've put in the covering letter, it must be related to the job and related to the experience. So for example, I always say also too with young people is that you find that Sometimes a young person doesn't have much experience, but let's say, for example, a young person worked in, uh, let me say, uh, how would I want to say, maybe worked in a, in, a, in a, did some volunteering work in the church, for example, right? And where they were able then to utilize their leadership skills, put it on the CV, because at least it gives me something that you've done something, it might not have paid, but you have some experience in that leadership. So put it there. So I think it's really how you're framing your information. Of course, not to say, you know, I was a CEO in a company and the company was you, only just you, then, you know, that just doesn't work. But at least you can pull on some of your skills and put them there and show that they're relevant to the job at hand, yeah? So that's very important, I think, because we will be looking at one's profile. And in one's profile, we want to know that the experience which we are asking for does exist. And if you're looking in Africa, important to say what it is that you did, yeah? So I hope that explains or that gives you a question to that one. Then um, the second question is about uh, successes, stories of successes and failure for generations before us. I think that's a good question as well. And I mean, I'm just going to give you what, my, what I've seen from, for example, my mother, because that's the only one which I can think of right now, yeah? But I think, you know, in those days of our mothers, they used to go to school and when they used to go to school, for example, they were able to do more than just the, uh, what do you call it, the education, how, how do I want to put it, is that, you know, when you are training, for example, to be a nurse, because that's what my mother trained for, but she tells me that, you know, they were doing uh, cooking, they were doing sewing, they were doing baking, they were doing all of those other things as well. And I think those other skills as well, which we don't do now, because now when we go to school, it's just strictly uh, you know, your books and your, you know, we just do the technical stuff. Like when I did, you know, my first degree, it was really just, you know, the, the marketing courses, the finance courses, accounting, but not the practicals. But then what I see is that someone like my mother is, even if she does not have that nursing, she's able to bounce into something else because she has that skill in terms of baking, cooking, 
and she can then even utilize that to generate an income. And so those aspects, I think sometimes where, and I want to say this because I think it's an important point too, is that you know where you might have your hobbies and your hobbies don't necessarily fit into a degree in accounting, a degree in, in uh, what do you call it, in finance, but let's say you love cooking, you love baking. I mean, that can be turned into a round, into a job and you can make money from that if you really, really love it, yeah? I give my last example, which I would like to give here is that, you know, when I was young, I learned how to do the braiding and all of that. And so when I went to study in the US, that became my source of additional income. I started just making money because I could braid and I could braid and I got myself a hundred dollars here and there. And that really helped. And even now I could say, let me go into that field if I wanted to, but hey, I can only do so much, yeah? Thank you, Obelang. Um, you know, in our generation, we, we like to say what you just described is we need to learn how to hustle. Um, you know, hustling is, is you know, it's, it's a necessity. Um, being able to turn, like you said, your hobbies and, and even commercialize them, right? Not just thinking, how, not just doing those things for pleasure, but even how can I, you know, provide those services to others. So um, I think that's an easy and, and an exciting uh, point to bring up. Thank you. All right, there are some questions that I will share with you um, that people have asked in the chat so that we can take a step at them. Uh, Godwin uh, was going back to our point around the national employment policies. Uh, his question was, how do we bridge the gap between policy formulation and implementation? Now that we know that there are national employment policies that do exist but how do we bridge that gap between formulation and implementation? And the other question is from Jemberu, who says, I'm a clinical midwife uh, in the rural area, in, in, a, in a rural area in Ethiopia. Um, the care at this level is not well organized. How can we enhance maternity care service as a whole in Africa? Okay. So thank you for that. Some of them are getting harder, but anyway, let me see how I can tackle them, yeah? <laughs> you're doing, so, you're yes, doing a good uh, job. You're doing a good job so far. So I think uh, the audience is uh, increasing the, the level of difficulty for you. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So thank you so much uh, with uh, Goodwin's question. Now, Goodwin, you, you ask a very good question. And uh, what one often hears is that Africa is not, uh, that, uh, how can I put it, Africa, has a whole number of policies. Yeah, so coming up with policies is not an issue, but the point is how do we implement them, yeah? So, I mean, I think it's exactly the same question even with employment policies as well, is that yes, we can formulate the best of employment policies, we can uh, have the best of industrialization policies, but how do we implement them? So I think that is a very, very good, um, question, which I don't have the answer, but I think the point is that, I think the, and also too, I think what some of the struggle though, that you know, there are so many policies. So how then do we probably bring these policies to be more coherent so that they are talking to one another and such that when they talk to one another, then maybe we would be able to implement some of them. But if they are all not coherent, then implementing them is going to be a challenge. So, I don't think I can go beyond that because this is a million dollar question. And if someone in the audience can address that one would be great because it is a problem throughout the continent. Many policies, but not always, and many times not being implemented, yeah? So that's what I think is a crucial point, yeah? So um, the other one from Jamburi is um, the, uh, uh, what was it, maternal? I think uh, yes. the, yes the midwife, being a midwife, maternity care. Now, I think this is part of another issue as well. And uh, maybe also let me say that I think the sector where you are is a, yeah, is a, is, a, is a great sector. And I think what we have seen is that this is one of the sectors where there's a great potential of job opportunities, the care sector. And, but as we know that the care sector many times is under budgeted in many of our countries, or the resources are not necessarily going 
to the needs of where they should be going in terms of, you know, the, uh, the health infrastructure, et cetera, et cetera. So that's a big, big one in terms of what you have said. Uh, how can we then enhance maternity care? That's another good question. And uh, yeah, I would believe then, you know, at this end, this is where then there's that peer pressure by the various um, countries at the AU levels, regional economic community levels, as to how do we increase our health budgets, but you can increase the health budget, but if the money doesn't go to where it's targeted, we'll still have this, uh, this, this example as well. So I think also too, is maybe also community engagement in the maternity care services and private sector. Maybe those are the other options that can be done, but we do know that, you know, the basics, health, education, uh, belong, uh, you know, are under the government purview, but of course, I think our governments too are getting stretched and stretched with uh, demographic dividends, populations. So I think we have to think through as to what can be done in this area, but definitely I think it's, yeah, I appreciate you raising it, but yeah, that's what it is, yeah. Thank you, Obolang. Um, I know that one of the things you enjoy doing is being a mentor uh, for a lot of young people. And, and you know, in addition to sharing um, your your perspectives and challenging us like this, you know, we also want to benefit and tap into that uh, mentorship of yours. Uh, someone in the audience was asking, because, you know, as young people, we, we don't have, you know, unemployment is high, as we discussed, and as a result, we do not have the experience, right, in a, in a professional sense. So what is your advice uh, if you're giving one of us, if we want to get that first job, what is some of that general advice you would give us? Okay, so thanks for that, and that's a good one, yeah? And I think the point, though, is that I think where we need to go back to is we need to go to volunteering. Yeah, volunteerism, where you are going to go do something and not get paid for it. Yeah, that's one option. And, but because I know that also too, there's that aspect, I mean, of course, having spoken to youngsters, including nephews and all is that you have to, you have to be ready to start at the bottom. Yeah, because I think many times, you know, there are young people, for example, who look at me and say, oh yeah, you know, because many young people call me Sis Hops, by the way. Yeah, so they say, Sis Hops, you want to be exactly where you are. And I say, yeah, 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 I hear you, but you have to start at the bottom. So you have to sometimes just say to yourself, okay, I hate, well, not hate, but I really don't like what I'm doing, but I'm going to do it and I'm going to do it so well. So for me, I think it's showing up all the time, consistently willing to learn, willing to start at the bottom, humility. And humility is key. It's not only something which starts with your job, with your first job experience. I've learned that as you, climb up and become more humble, more humble, you'll go places. But then if you now get caught up in things about, you know, oh, I know it all. I don't need to learn from her. I don't need to learn from him. You're going to, it's going to, there's, there's going to be problems moving forward. So for me, what I feel is that volunteer, you know, whether you are involved in a, 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 like, I mean, a lot of you young ones, you have skills, for example, where, I mean, I'm just giving an example here. You might have uh, this, you might be very good in mathematics, go volunteer and tutor someone. Tutor someone in order to, you know, at a high school for no pay and just do it. And you'll see the rewards that you'll get from that. And also too, I think it does something for you as a person because you are also plowing back into the community in that way as well. So I would say that's where we start. Start where you have to volunteer. The UN has a program which is called the UN Volunteers, yeah? I know they do pay a little bit of money, but I think that's already another good opportunity for one to get through the doors, get a bit of experience and move forward, yeah? So UN volunteers is one, look for other in volunteers. I mean, I know internships are there, I know job placements are there, but they're not always um, readily available, but even at church, wherever, just volunteer because you are going to get some skills in doing that for sure, yeah? Amazing advice. Thank you, Opaleng. We have a question, a hand raised. Yeah, uh, Elhansa, do you have a question? Hello. Yes, I do. Um, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, first of all, thank you so much to our dear guest, Hopolang, for um, sharing her valuable time with us. 
Um, I'm going to introduce myself very briefly. My name is Al-Khansa. I'm 25 years old. I work in project management. I'm Algerian and I am extremely interested in all that's related to educational reforms. Um, one of the major problems of um, employment or unemployment in Algeria is the orientation problem that exists within the education system. Our culture and the back exam, which is the final exam that our students have to go through before leaving high school, um, chooses or holds the centralized power um, over the paths or the careers or the job, uh, the, the potential jobs that students could enter after finishing universities. So what they study in university, and then because of the lack of choices and the inability to change majors, they're stuck um, working in something um, that they studied in university after having very, very little choice um, over, over uh, what, what they think they should be doing in the future. Um, and I personally believe this is one of the major problems of why we have this gap between the, the job market and the rates at which, P, uh, at which students are graduating in the different uh, fields at university. And um, we, need, we need data, we need very clear data on what type of jobs that are needed in the Algerian economy in the different fields. And we don't have that. Um, and I, as you have been, uh, as you pointed out earlier about vocational training, and uh, it's also a cultural thing to stay, to steer away from that here in Algeria. My question is, why does the government keep steering away from showing or collecting this very, I, I believe, easily, uh, easily access data to the number of jobs available in, in each field within the job market. And why don't these number, don't we connect these numbers to the universities to help students choose majors that they know they will find jobs at later in the future? Plus, obviously, working more on the orientation in terms of trying to help students go to the to the fields that they're most that they would be better at or most talented at what is the importance of this data and what could be the challenges of of um working on this on on this type of solution i hope that was clear All right, uh, Opaleng, yes, feel free to unmute yourself okay. and respond. Yeah. Okay. So thank you very, very much for this uh, very good question, El Kansa. Uh, no, El, I hope I've said your name properly, yeah? Yes. <laughs> yes, El Kansa. So yes, yeah, so it's a very important question you ask. And um, uh, yeah, and I think where, where you come from is that I think you are saying that um, basically that they are specific skills and job, uh, job sets that are needed by the private sector, employers. But the point is that this is not necessarily what people are being trained in. And the system in Algeria, as you've said, is quite a very, it's, yeah, it seems to be quite controlled, yes, in terms of how then one sticks to their university training to be able to go into certain job areas. So I know that though is that I think if I recall, is it in Asia, is it probably Singapore, Hong Kong or somewhere where they actually have carried out these kinds of um, skills audits where they are actually trying to, they actually project and say that, you know, in the next five years, we are going to have jobs in the blue economy, green economy, and we need X number of students to come out with those particular skills. So I do, I feel that's a very important exercise because then at least when you're training, you're training for a market which is going to open and people will be able to get into these jobs. Unlike what happens in a lot of our countries right now where we are still not necessarily training for the job market. We are still caught up in you know, skills which when these young people graduate, they have no use to anybody. So 
I do, and I do know that the, this exercise of trying to do the audits and skills and whatever matching is not, it's not cheap. I don't think it comes cheap because especially if you are doing it to know how jobs look, will look like in the next five years, 10 years, et cetera. So I believe that maybe one of the reasons I don't know specifically for, you know, the case for Algeria, but I know in other countries is that the conversation then with employers, tertiary education, as uh, institutions, universities, and government, there's something missing in that conversation. And this is then what needs to be addressed in order to then be able to ascertain and to agree that this is what we should be doing. So maybe it's looking at the whole education system in isolation from the employment system. So I think these links need to be better done. And I know again too, because as ILO, we work very much in the skills area as well. And these are issues that we are saying, how can we also support governments working with Ministry of Higher Education, et cetera, to ensure that these conversations are happening to ensure uh, to address the skills, mismatch, skills mismatches. So it's an area we're working on. And I do agree with you that it needs more attention, but I'm not so, I can't answer to the specific context for Algeria, I'm not sure. I know we have an office in Algeria, so this is also now after this conversation, you can check out ILO, Algiers office, and probably you'll find a name of a skill specialist whom you could be able then to, you know, follow up on this important point you're raising. Yeah. Awesome. Um, we are surprisingly to me at time at the moment. So this session has gone by really fast. Uh, before we, we wrap up, uh, or pulling, I want to give you an opportunity to give us, you know, a call to action. You and I spoke, you know, we don't just want this to be a conversation that doesn't necessarily get packaged as uh, action. So um, maybe you can give us some parting words um, around, you know, uh, the topic and, and the session with that. Okay, so, but uh, Takunda, I do see someone with a hand raised. Is it Achola? Dina? Yes, uh, Chola, do you mind maybe quickly asking your question? Yes, thank you very much. I was getting sad that I would miss the moment, but thank you so much, Ms. Opolen. Um, I'm, a, I'm a teacher and I'm a Chola Dina from Uganda. So I posed a question that the mismatch in skills that is common among the youth is also a reflection of the quality of education that we get. And at the peak of all the education journey we undergo, we still have to look around for qualifications to put ourselves together and fit the, the available opportunities that come our way. But as an educator, I'm asking, how can the school systems be better prepared to produce employable people? Uh, must we wait for the higher institutions to take on this role? Or can we actually start involving the children from a very young stage so that by the time they reach the higher institutions, they are better prepared. And then secondly, what's the available approach to under-enumeration of the youth in today's workspaces? Many times the young people really set up for less because yes, the opportunities are few and few people are willing to take them in. So they end up being underpaid and doing really cumbersome workloads and all that. Thank you so much. Yeah. <laughs> Okay, so thank you. And very good questions you are bringing up, uh, Dina or Achola, yeah, whichever one you prefer to go with, yes. So yes, um, the, I do agree with you that what is coming out of our education systems too is also, uh, we, we begin to question because as you said, is what you put into or sow into someone's life is likely going to either reap good benefits or no benefits at the end of the day. So I do think that the discussions, I think discussions around a career, around employment opportunities should start quite young actually. And uh, one of the things which I think you, you know, and I was also even mentioning yesterday to Takunda is that when, where I am today is not something that I thought of when I was, you know, doing university. I didn't think I would ever end up, you know, as the, a, a, you know, a director in the ILO. No, that was not it. So I think the point is that from young ages, maybe we have to then, do, rather than doing it at a later stage in people's lives, is you know having those job fairs, having that career counseling. So those are skills which I think we need to have more of because you find that I think in the developing countries, they have a lot more of the career counseling. They have also to those issues of job fairs and just exposing 
young people to careers very young rather than doing it when one is already finished uni and you're looking for your first job. So I think that's how we could change that one is actually begin to integrate some of these things from a very young age as well and not just leave it to high school, but even do it before because this is when then you can get someone who says, you know, I want to be a plumber. And you don't say, oh, plumber, what are you going to do with that? But you actually say, okay, how do we make or help this person to actually get that qualification because it's needed and make sure that, you know, it's done very well. Like I do believe they do it like that in Germany with, you know, they, they, I mean, they're big, they big on that, yeah, on vocational training and education. And your second point too, about being underpaid. Yes, I do hear you loud and clear. That's what exactly happens. But I think the whole thing of underpaying too is that it's an issue where if now I wanted to talk to the other dimension, which is on harassment, on discrimination, you'd find that even sometimes just because of the mere fact that you are a woman, you're paid much less than a man. So there's those gender gaps as well in the salaries as well, which need to be addressed. And I, I, I believe then in terms of young people, Sometimes, yes, you are, your work is undervalued, your work is then underpaid. So I believe though in your journey of moving up career-wise, I think one has to then sometimes, you know, sometimes yeah, I'm going to yeah, be a little bit outrageous here, but then sometimes too is that when you know you're being taken advantage of, it, the honorable thing then is either to try to negotiate or you step out. Yeah, because the point is that when you sit there and you continue to know that you're giving this company everything and they are not failing you, then at some point you have to also then say, you know what, I'm out of here, it's not working. And someone else will pick you because of your hard work. So I believe that there's a season for being low paid, but then there's a season for you then to say, no, not anymore, I'm out of here, yeah? And not then to just remain confined and restricted in that space because you need to make your ends meet. Yeah, so I think, so yeah, so I think at the end of the day, what I'm probably saying, and this is probably bringing me to my last few points here is that, We've talked about the fact that, you know, not all of us are going to enter into the formal work streams of government, right? Or probably even being employed by companies. Some of us are going to have to create jobs, right? And I think where you create jobs, I think you have to then take what could be your hobbies and things you are passionate about, but being very innovative. Yeah, and innovation, I'm not talking of, you know, a Silicon Valley types, but there are some things where I think the opportunities are there to make money and you probably just need to also then to know who to talk to. So it's about also the whole issues around networking as well, in terms of the spaces where some of these discussions are happening to be part and parcel of them, to listen to what is being said and being involved in them. That's one. Second one too is I think then, you know, with the, with, with as I mentioned to start off with, and I'm, this is where I'm calling you to action too, because this is part of what I'm saying here is that, other similar entities like yourself, how can you guys come together? How can you rally around the cause and become you know, those young people whom we want to see something changing, we want to see something being done differently. And then when you have come together and created those kind of uh, bodies and entities, then I think then it gives you voice in terms of then even approaching entities like the UN. We are coming here, we are representing youth from North Africa, South Africa, West Africa, East Africa, Central Africa. This is our combined agenda. We have a following of one of you know, 10,000 young people. I mean, so you're, someone's going to listen to you, right? So I think that's part of what it is then. And then of course too, I believe that, yeah, you guys just keep making noise. Yeah, keep making noise. Yeah, let your voices be heard, get involved in, whatever platforms you can find yourself to be able to be echoing the same, the same things at all times and don't get tired because there's a time for getting tired and when you get tired, that's the end of it. Or there's a time of just wanting your voices to be heard. Yeah? So that's what I really just want to say to all of you is that just look, yeah, I mean, I, I, mean, I don't think I'm the only one here who's you know, in, interested in youth employment. I think there are many other hooplands around. I think those are the ones to whom we have to try to uh, you know, touch base with them. And what Future Africa is doing is great. It's, I think, opening the doors for you guys to meet such uh, you know, people who could be able then to talk to your cause and take issues forward, yeah? 
Fantastic. Um, thank you, Hopaleng. Um, are we allowed to start calling you Sis Hops now? Sure, you can call me Sis Hops. Yeah. <laughs> thank you. I'm I'm very excited uh, to 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 be to be joining that group. Um, so you know, without further ado, since you're already over, we'd like to extend you a very very warm thank you. Uh, and you know, we're really grateful for you taking the time. I think this was a very rich conversation that only time is cutting short. Uh, otherwise, we would have gone on. Uh, but you know, you left us with a lot of great questions. Uh, you gave us a lot of great insights, and um, we will definitely be in touch. Uh, and you know, you and I will connect, and then make sure that our audience as well, should they like to connect, um, we can we can make sure that information is taken care of. Uh, for for everybody else on this call, this is you know is the end of uh, this month's forum. And we have our next one on November 5. So please stay tuned to that. If you would like to um, just get in touch with us for any reasons, our email address is info at futureafrica.net. That's info at futureafrica.net. So please feel free to reach out to us, let us know, um, you know your thoughts, your comments, feedback, etc. But yeah, uh, this is the end of this month's forum on uh, employment uh, versus empowerment. So thank you, Sis Pops, for taking your time and have a good rest of your weekend. Thank you so much to all of you. And I appreciate all your questions and just the dialogue that has happened. So thank you. And Takunda, thank you for doing a great job with facilitating the session. Piranha, thank you for reaching out. And all of you, thank you. And uh, may you guys have a good day and please keep employment on your radar screens. Thank you. Thank you very much. Yes.